Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Anna, I'm the Director of Public Health. Uh, really good to see so many people on the call and welcome today and, and thanks for coming. Um, people keep asking me what my strategy is to get um, the, the vaccination messages out to local people and I keep looking, keep saying you. Um, so our champions basically um, and our other system leaders, so um, our imams, our um, you know, church leaders um, are, are absolutely vital to getting that out there. So we're really, really lucky today because um, we've got Dr. Colin Spears, who has done a lot of good work in Wakefield around all sorts of things, diabetes being a, a specialist area of his. And he's also the um, clinical lead for the COVID, COVID vaccination programme. He's come to talk to us today, which is really kind, Colin, because I know how incredibly busy GPs are in primary care are. So we really, really appreciate it. Um, and I'll just let you say hello. Uh, hi everybody, so I'm not in a prison cell, the bars behind <laughs> windows, I'm currently in Castleford at one of our vaccination sites. Um, brilliant, so you're kind of, that's quite, you're, you're at a vaccination site, that makes it even more exciting. Um, and then I just want to introduce Jo Fitzpatrick, who's our lead officer um, for the vaccination programme, so she's our senior responsible officer across the Wakefield patch. Um, and, is, and that's a, a fairly sort of, as you can imagine, an incredibly busy role. And again, we're incredibly grateful that Joe's taken time out today to come and talk to all of us. Um, so Joe, do you want to say hello? Thanks, Anna. Uh, so yeah, hi, I'm Joe Fitzpatrick. Some of you might uh, have met me. I am a pharmacist by background um, and uh, I've been working in Wakefield for 19 years and I am a, a, a well, I'm a Featherstone girl. I, I live in Wakefield as well. So um, hopefully know our population really well. And I'm responsible for um, ensuring that all of the eligible population in Wakefield uh, can have access to the vaccine when it's their turn um, and making sure that we've got all our sites operational and running well and safely. Thanks, Jo. Um, and then we've got Emma Smith, um, who works in my team, who's the Head of Health Protection. Emma, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. I'm sure some people have heard from me previously. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and then we've got Kerry, who, who's already introduced herself um, and, and is also sort of a key, a key member of the team. So that's, I think that's for all of us. So I think we're moving over to Jo now. If you could just do a bit of an introduction to the vaccination programme, Jo, for us. Thanks, Kerry. Yeah. So uh, the vaccination programme started, as you, as you will all be aware, because it is so much in the media, it's, uh, it's probably... Uh, one of the number one topics at the moment um, out there on social media and the general media as well. So the, the vaccine rollout is starting. It's actually started, uh, we will say, and I, I'm going to give an update on where we are uh, in Wakefield with it. But um, we have uh, started with the vaccination programme in December. Uh, that's when the Pfizer vaccine that you will have all heard about got its uh, marketing authorization. And then on the 31st of December, that followed very quickly with the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine gaining its authorization as well. So um, we are fortunate in this country that we've got two vaccines to choose from to vaccinate our population. And if we just go to the next slide, please. So how uh, the vaccination program works, it's a national vaccination program with um, a central um, center, a uh, control center that decides, um, a, an expert panel of people that decides how um, the vaccine will be rolled out um, and also on how much vaccine supply goes to each area of the country. So in terms of the priority cohort groups, the Joint Committee of Vaccination and Immunization, the JCVI, that's what that stands for, they're an expert panel of people who, who look after vaccines and immunizations for a, a range of diseases, not just COVID. Um, and so they're real experts on this. And what they've done, they've looked at evidence, they've looked at the vaccine, the, the properties of the vaccine, they've looked at the evidence of, of COVID and which parts of the population suffer worse from COVID when they get it. And, um, and they've used that to decide on how we roll out that vaccination program because we can't just make it available to everybody straight away um, through um, supply and also through capacity to be able to vaccinate everyone. So um, the, the, the order of priority is number one residents in a care home for older adults and their carers. So I, if I just uh, give a, a number there, so if you're a resident in a care home, um, you, you only need to vaccinate 20 residents in a care home to prevent one death from COVID. 
So that is the reason why care homes, and that's compared to um, 150 people over the age of 80 who live in their own homes. So that is the reason why, and we know um, that care homes have been particularly badly hit by uh, the COVID virus uh, in terms of worse outcomes and deaths. So very important that care homes for older adults and their carers were, were in that first vaccination cohort. Then um, it's all those over age of 80 and frontline health and social care workers, because they're the ones that are having contact with the public and also with vulnerable people. Um, and also a workforce that, that needs to keep going really and, and not having to, to uh, self-isolate due to having COVID. And then um, it moves further down in terms of age range, which is all those over 75. And then to those over 70 and in with that is added clinically extremely vulnerable individuals. So that's the ones that have been asked to shield uh, during the COVID pandemic. And then further after that, we move down to over 65s uh, alongside those that um, are deemed high risk. And there's some categories uh, that, that talk about that. And then we're going to over 60s, over 50s, over 50s. And the eventual aim is to vaccinate everybody over the age of 18. Um, but it is estimated that the groups above on this slide, over 50, are the ones that represent about 99% of uh, deaths from COVID uh, or preventable deaths if we vaccinated people. So if we can get everybody over the age of 50 done, we've, we've uh, really um, made a big inroad into uh, fighting against this pandemic. So in terms of where we are at the moment, um, this in a care home for older, older adults and carers uh, in Wakefield, we anticipate uh, and the target that we've been set is to have everybody, uh, every care home visited and the residents vaccinated by the end of uh, Sunday, the 24th of January. So that's the, the date and we anticipate that that will have happened in Wakefield and it's the primary care networks, which I'll come on to in a moment, that are delivering that. Um, in terms of all those aged over 80 and frontline health and social care workers, the target was the end of January and we are on track for that uh, with a few caveats for exclusions such as the housebound, but we are catching up rapidly with that and the reason why we're a little bit behind with the housebound is because um, the, of the vaccine, uh, we were only given permission to move the AstraZeneca vaccine out to housebound patients last week. So that's why we're catching up um, with those that people that can't, uh, that aren't mobile and able to get to, uh, to a vaccination centre. And then the target, the next target is by mid-February that we'd have all our over 70s and clinically extremely vulnerable individuals vaccinated as well. And we are on track with that and uh, should receive the vaccine supply to do that. And then we're putting in plans after that for, for the other cohorts. So if we just it's me. So I think this slide is just about demonstrating that we have a long standing history of vaccination campaigns uh, within the UK and, and vaccinations go through rigorous processes all the times in terms of safety checks. And that's both at the trial phase and sort of the manufacturing phase as well. Um, and every vaccination batch that's produced, it always is tested before it goes into sort of the population domain and public. And I'd li I, I like my Bake Off, so I'd, I'd liken it to sort of baking buns in terms of vaccine production. So we have our tried and tested recipes. We follow those recipes. We check our ingredients before we start making the, our vaccine. Uh, we check our oven temperature in terms of safety checks. And these checks happen for vaccination in, in, the, in the pathway. And then we get our buns, our 12 buns at the end of the day, and, and that's liking it to our batch of vaccine. And with, with buns, we can't attempt, we can't resist that urge to just eat one. So we always will check that um, one bun batch before we um, share it with our friends and families. And a similar process happens with, with vaccine. We always check the batches that are produced before it is then delivered into the public um, domain. So vaccine is uh, really got rigorous uh, safety um, mechanisms around it. And this side just says as well that we've a long standing history 90, in the 1700s when we introduced the small um, pox vaccination. And then uh, prior to the COVID vaccine, we had the HPV vaccination. So we do have a trusted history of delivering vaccination programmes and the benefits that brings for us. 
Uh, next slide, please. So I, I've briefly touched on, on this aspect already. So next slide, please. And I'll hand over to Colin, who's going to talk about how the vaccines themselves work. Hi, everyone. So I think it's important to think about uh, with, with vaccines is that the stage we're at now is usually built upon decades of research before. And there have been questions as to how the vaccines have been able to be released so quickly. It's because of that previous work. So the, um, the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine is actually based on work that was done on an Ebola vaccine. And all vaccines work in a similar way, which is to expose your body to a part of the, the, the infectious agent, so the, the, the virus in this case, uh, but not the whole virus or, or, or a dead version of the virus that can't reproduce in your body and make you ill. So to expose your body to a bit of it so that when your body is exposed to the real virus out in the environment, it's experienced it before and it's already been triggered to, uh, to build a, an immune response so it can fight that off. So uh, you receive the vaccine, your body builds um, uh, antibodies and also builds um, uh, uh, immune cells which can fight the virus or fight the cells that the virus infects when you, when, when you encounter it in the future. And that you either you either catch um, uh, COVID in this case, but you experience much milder symptoms or, or no symptoms, or you um, you catch COVID. Thank you. Next slide. So this is back to me. So um, we have a long history of effective programs in the UK. And this slide just looks at the different programs that we have had over the course of the years. But in particular, I'd just like to highlight the measles. So we had measles uh, in general population sort of in the 19... Hundreds, and then we saw the introduction of the vaccination program within, you know, 1968. And the benefit of that vaccination program was we've seen a reduction in measles over a period of time. And obviously, presently, we see less and less cases. And in terms of measles, you will be very familiar with um, people reporting measles outbreaks. And what happens in those situations is where certain pockets of the population or certain groups don't actually um, participate in the programme or haven't been vaccinated for whatever reason. And then we see measles cases arise. And then any unprotected individuals are susceptible to measles. And then we have what is described as a measles outbreak. What the COVID vaccination is trying to do is to do this at speed as well. So this is why there is this national ambition to to have as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible and working through the JCBI groups as quickly as we possibly can. Because what we want to do is shorten that sort of period of time from where we introduce the vaccination programme and the number of COVID cases we subsequently have. So the quicker we can deliver the programme, the quicker the um, individuals can be vaccinated and the quicker we can protect those individuals. And so that time period of um, seeing a reduction in cases is um, shorter and we see a reduction in cases a lot quicker. And I think this slide just illustrates the benefit of an immunisation programme quite well. Next slide, please. And this is sort of um, points of contact for trusted information, because we know that a lot of information is circulating in the public domain. We know a lot of people have uh, questions. A lot of people are an anxious about the vaccine. And sort of the real important factor is where can you get trusted sources of information? And all of these websites will provide you with that information uh, in, in great detail about um, the, what are the plans for the vaccine, the benefits of the vaccine, if you're pregnant, if you're breastfeeding, um, you know, we get the fertility questions, if you've got any other clinical uh, conditions, how does that affect the vaccination programme? People are anxious about having allergic reactions sometimes to vaccines. Um, and then, you know, we have information about there. And we'd always encourage people to have that clinical discussion with their, their health professional before they actually have the vaccination, if they've got any concerns about their individual health or their individual needs as well. Next slide, please. I'll pass over to Joanne now. Thanks, Emma. Um, so in terms of um, how we are delivering vaccines across Wakefield, in the beginning uh, of the programme, the GP practices uh, were the first people to be offered uh, the vaccine through, through a service that they could provide. And they were asked to collaborate um, as the primary care networks that they are already part of 
to be able to um, designate sites that they could deliver the vaccine from. Now, um, these sites, um, there was a, a lot of, um, uh, there was a time pressure on being able to stand these sites up and it had to be sites that were not going to affect the running of the GP practice business and they had to be um, sites that were able to be registered with the CQC as being uh, clinically appropriate and safe and available for the vaccination program. So they were the criteria in which the sites had to be selected. Um, so in terms of the primary care network sites, the, the sites that were designated and are approved um, are Castleford Civic Centre at Castleford, King's Medical Centre at Normanton, St Swithin's uh, Community Centre at Eastmore in Wakefield, Sandal Rugby Union Club and the Churchview Health Centre at South Kirkby. Um, in terms of the um, hospital, uh, in terms of, the, so they're delivering the vaccination to our over 80s population and they've just opened up the vaccination to the over 70s and clinically extremely vulnerable as well. And they are also doing what we call the roving vaccinator model, uh, where they are, whereby they are um, mobile, taking the vaccination out to um, the care home staff and residents in the care homes of our uh, of our district and also um, for, um, yeah, to the care home staff and also for the housebound as well, sorry. In terms of other sites that are available in Wakefield, we have three hospital vaccination sites. They are purely for the vaccination of health and care workers because as you saw from that priority group, they were part of those priorities as well. Um, and it, they are easily accessible for our, the bulk of our health and care workers frontline. And then the other places that we've got coming on board as well is the Community Vaccination Centre, um, which is uh, due to open on Monday. Um, and it's, that is through the National Booking Service. And that I can announce is at Navigation Walk in Wakefield, which is on um, the waterfront uh, up near the Hepworth. Um, that uh, people can book onto that if they have received the letter through the post as uh, so the priority cohorts I think over 75s so are currently being sent letters through the post if they've not already received the vaccination at a GP practice site, at a PCN site. Um, and they follow the instructions on there and can choose to um, go to a community vaccination centre to have it. But don't have to go to the one in the field. You can go to one that's, uh, I think you, you've got the opportunity to go to one which is in a 40 minute drive of your home address. Um, so the, the slots are open for navigation walk, as I understand currently, um, or will be going live very soon. In addition to that, tomorrow, uh, we've got the Community Pharmacy Vaccination Centre run by a company called Pharmacy to You, you might be familiar with. They're opening tomorrow at the Morrison's Car Park at Dewsbury Road at Lupsit. And uh, they also are part of the National Booking Service. So again, it's uh, you're offered to, um, a, a, a slot for your appointment from uh, booking in through the letter that will be received through the post when it's your turn to be invited for a vaccination. Um, and there is the potential to open more sites if required. Um, we are looking at another pharmacy to use sites elsewhere in Wakefield, but that is all subject to site readiness and value for money checks at the moment um, uh, to make sure that it is appropriate and uh, right for, for the population to go there for their vaccination. Um, and that's it in terms of the delivery model. In terms of how we're doing as a district, we are um, doing very well. Um, the North East Yorkshire region's uh, vaccinating quite a good proportion and Wakefield as a place amongst the North Eastern Yorkshire region, we have got a good uptake of the, the vaccine in our over 80s population. And uh, like I said, by Sunday, we expect all the care home staff and residents to have been offered a vaccination. And we are on track to meet that mid-February deadline for clinically extremely vulnerable and the over 70s too. So it's, uh, it, we are all in a, a good place in terms of uh, the ability to uh, vaccinate. Um, just a, a note about patient experience as well, a lot of the feedback that we've had from people that have gone to have their vaccinations at the vaccination sites uh, to press have, have all given really positive feedback. We've received uh, quite a number of compliments around uh, the patient experience. So um, to, to date, it's uh, been very good. Um, so, but obviously we are um, continually 
obtaining feedback from the sites and looking for improvement and sharing good practice amongst the sites, uh, whether that's a hospital site or the places where the primary care networks are delivering the vaccination in order for us to learn. It is a learning process. We've set this, these sites up um, in response to the demand for the vaccine and the vaccination programme and um, people have worked incredibly hard and um, in order to set these up and to vaccinate numbers of our population so far. Um, so if we just go to the, the next slide, please. So in terms of when, when the vaccine, you get the vaccine, um, so as I've just talked about the JCVI priority cohorts is the, the factor which defines when people will be invited to come and have their vaccine. Um, it's important that you don't contact the NHS for a vaccination before you get your invitation because uh, GP practices, for example, they are using their phone lines for a lot of consultations at the moment, so it's important to keep those as free as possible. And also they're very busy doing their, their normal business in addition to running a very complex vaccination programme and delivering those vaccines. So it is important that we keep the GP practice lines free as much as possible. Um, and, and people will get their letter if they are registered with a general practice. For people that aren't registered with a general practice, um, we have got a separate work stream that are looking at that to ensure that nobody is disadvantaged just because they don't happen to be registered with a general practice. And we will um, we'll have plans in place, we have got plans in place in, in order to be able to um, uh, vaccinate uh, those people as well that aren't registered. So as I've said, either a GP practice will contact uh, the people in those priority cohorts to have a, an appointment has been happening since uh, the middle of December when we started on this program. Um, and also letters are being sent out to people on that list every week from the national program, from the national booking service as well. But it might be that people don't get that letter straight away because we have to manage this in tranches. There's only so much vaccine supply coming out every week but all I can assure you is that we are on track to vaccinate everybody with the supply that we've got. Um, if we go to the next slide, please. So um, I'll hand over to Colin just to give that frontline general practitioner perspective of uh, your experience over the last few weeks of the primary care network sites being operational. Colin, please. Again, everyone, you'll notice I've moved areas because um, this site was being used, space being used for lunch, but they've all left it now. So this is the stage at Casford Civic Centre, for those of you that know it. Um, so the, the, the programme's been going very well, very fast. Um, general practices have been initially inviting in uh, uh, the, the registered patients uh, via phoning them up as the, the quickest way of getting in touch with people to book them into the site because initially uh, getting quite short notice when vaccines have been available and, and it's, it's been very hard to forward plan weeks and weeks in advance to know what the appointments will be. Will, will be. Uh, we're probably getting to the stage where some uh, practices will be also be starting to send you out some letters ask, inviting you to phone them alongside the letters that you'll be receiving from your uh, from, from the National Booking Service and also some practices are at the stage of starting to use a booking system that uses text messaging um, so that you receive a text message which comes from your practice but those that don't have mobile phones to be uh, smartphones to be able to use that they'll also be the uh, opportunity you'll also be approached by your practice through, through another mechanism uh, the vaccine that we're using is as we've said before has been through through lots of checks as a frontline worker i've had my vaccine about three or four weeks ago it's very common for people to get a slightly achy arm when, when when they've had it the next day and some people can experience a couple of other mild side effects which disappear after a day or two but can include things like feeling um feeling tired having headaches uh, or feeling a bit warm or, or, or a bit cold the, you'll notice here that it talks about there's been a change in, in, in how the vaccine's been delivered compared to, to how initially planned. So initially we planned to, to give a vaccine and then uh, the first dose and then book in for three to four weeks later, second dose. Um, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, Officers of, of, of uh, Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland, as well as the, uh, the JVCI, uh, Royal College of General Practitioners, Public Health England and uh, very many August bodies all uh, put forward a recommendation that was important to get as much coverage to the population as quickly as possible. And that's based on, on them re-looking at the evidence which shows that, um, say for the Pfizer vaccine, um, about two weeks after you've had your first dose, you're probably 
that 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 coverage will probably be about 90 percent effective you see various numbers and it's, it's really tricky so you'll see numbers that go from somewhere between 74 percent after seven days to up to 90 percent after two weeks and for astrazeneca that's about 73 percent after 22 days so that means that you know 100 people that were, were given the vaccine 70 73 percent of the 73 of them would would have a good level of, of protection and wouldn't experience in more, most importantly, severe COVID symptoms that would result in them requiring hospitalisation, but also increase the, 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 rate, the rate of them not having COVID uh, symptoms at all. And that's why we've, we've seen a, a delay in this second dose, which will take place uh, uh, 12 weeks after your first dose. Uh, so further invitations will, will come out from both uh, the national booking system as well as from your local GP practices to invite you in for your second dose because we've got records of when everybody has had their first dose as well okay um, when you come in there'll be the opportunity to ask, ask questions but we also uh, take each individual through some some counseling to tell them about the vaccine ask them some questions about their general health that could be a factor in having the vaccine but it's important to note that the there's very few reasons why anybody can't have this vaccine. In fact, it's basically if you're under 16 or if you're currently pregnant. Um, there have been some concerns about, uh, about severe anaphylactic reactions in, in relation to uh, the Pfizer vaccine, but we've gone further forward and seen more use. We're seeing uh, not very many episodes of anaphylaxis since actually very, to very particular bits, the stuff that's inside the vaccine itself, which is something that you would expect anyway. So we've become, uh, we've reduced some of the warnings around the reasons why you can't have uh, the Pfizer vaccine but those that approached were invited in very early on that had a history of having had a severe allergic reaction so an anaphylactic reaction may have been said that uh, been advised that we should delay it until later on and be offered the the um the oxford astrazeneca vaccine and all sites are kind of currently working on a plan to invite those that were excluded as a as a, as a consequence of the anaphylactic history in for an astrazeneca vaccine then that's something that that's going to be happening over future weeks so we're constantly tracking who's had the vaccine. We're constantly working, figuring out who we've got to invite in. We're all aware that there are people that are in care homes that we think we've done the care homes, but there may be new people going to live in care homes. And so we're tracking the, the, those people that are still outstanding for their first dose and coming up with plans to make sure that we get everybody uh, the opportunity to be invited in. Of course, people may choose to decline to have it. Um, there are mainly Two other reasons why we wouldn't want you to come for your COVID, do uh, your COVID vaccine, and that's if you're currently unwell, so particularly if you're experiencing a fever or COVID symptoms, we wouldn't want you to come in. We generally have advice that if you've had COVID within the last four weeks, uh, initially we said you shouldn't have it. Now we would say that if you're experiencing, still experiencing COVID symptoms that you shouldn't have it. And that's mainly in case you get more unwell with your COVID. We wouldn't, uh, after you've had your vaccine, we'd like to know that it's because of the COVID and not because of the COVID vaccine, which we would expect you to get some side effects from. Uh, but as I said before, uh, your GP practice will, in, will invite you in. So please don't contact them because they're, they're currently you know, phoning hundreds of people a week per practice to invite them in for a COVID vaccine alongside all the other work that they're currently doing. And there's also going to be those, those, those national letters coming to you. And when at the end of your vaccine, uh, you'll be offered uh, information to take home in the form of leaflets. Uh, and there's also really good quality information out there, particularly on the NA NHS website. Now, can I have the next slide, please? So I, th I think this is really talking about, you know, the scale of this. So we have never ever vaccinated an entire population in these time frames before. Uh, I, I, it, it's it's a monumental effort, uh, which is incredibly important to 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 you know free us all up from the threat of COVID and also to allow us to return to more normal lives. It's really important to think about though that after people have had their COVID vaccine, they're not instantly immune. And so it the, you know really important that everybody does continue to follow the national guidance about hands, face, and space, because it takes a while for that individual to build up immunity. But they also at the moment we don't know whether somebody who's had a, vi a vaccine can still shed vaccine uh, virus if they become infected. So there's there's a there's a missing element of data that, uh, and evidence that we're trying to get, which is does vac vaccination mean as well as protecting you from getting severe COVID symptoms, does it protect the population from you infecting them? So until we know that, it is important to continue with the, with the national guidance. Um, can we continue, go to the next slide, please? 
and this is about scams. I was really, I was really saddened by this, and, I, and I've, I've had ever, uh, examples of, of them thrown, uh, sent through to me. So it's really important to know that the NHS will never ask you to pay for a COVID vaccine. Uh, this is entirely free, and there'll be nobody should be asking for any details from you as a method of proving who you are. So you'd never be asked for your credit card or or debit card number. Um, at a push, you might be asked for your date of birth to prove who you are, and that's just to check that we're speaking to the right person. If anybody phones you, it, it would be from it should be from a practice that that you know. And if you're uncertain, if you think you've you've got somebody that's fishing for it for, for, for as a as a as a method of fraud please you know feel free to hang up and, and, and phone them back if it doesn't seem entirely appropriate uh, the letters that we send out will all be uh, appropriately branded so they'll have the nhs branding and it'll have details about who sent it through uh, and if you get a text message it would most likely come from your own practice or it would have some branding that would suggest it's from your practice so uh, or related to the nhs and if you're if you're not comfortable that it is from the NHS, just don't follow it. And, and again, that will be part of your invitation for a vaccine. So do feel free in that instance to phone your practice as a method of, of obtaining your 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 your, uh, your COVID vaccine. Um, next slide, please. So I think this is handing me handing over at this stage. Yep, that's fine. Thank you, everybody. That's hugely informative. Um, we've got some questions that have been submitted in advance, so we'll just cover those for a minute. There's questions in the chat bar as well. There's a few. Um, there's some for you, Joe, and there's um, at least one for you, Colin. So I'm just going to quickly go through these and then we'll move to the other questions that we've got for you to answer in real time. So one of the questions is, does the vaccine contain animal products? And the vaccine does not contain animal products, neither the Pfizer nor the AstraZeneca one. Um, contain animal products. Um, what is the vaccination criteria or people have got concerns about being missed? Um, and that's just to reiterate what's already been said. Um, people will be called when it is their turn and we are looking at people who might for whatever reason not be registered with a GP um, and we will follow up people um, who don't appear to have come forward to the vaccine just to make sure that they've got all the right information and that they do know everything they need to know about uh, taking up the offer if they should wish to do so. Um, family members are sometimes sent to different locations because perhaps they're registered at different GP practices or through the national booking system, as Joe mentioned, um, they may be able to choose a different location as far as we understand. Obviously, that's, that's the emerging detail at the moment. Um, and there's a question there about um, people, some people from one surgery being allocated appointment more than others, which Joe covered in her presentation. Um, and they hope, um, um, what Joe said really clearly was that um, there should be uh, there shouldn't be much more of a time like and that the people are being invited at great speed. Now the programme is really up and running and, and going at great speed. Um, so there's a question about wastage um, of the vaccine. Um, Joe, I'm just wondering if you want to come and answer that question, because I don't think we've covered it in the presentation. Um, you know, if people have been offered the vaccination, but they're not part of the JVCI criteria, that might be because there was a vaccine going wasted. Is any of the vaccination wasted? Um, there's very minimal amounts of the vaccine wasted. Um, and that might be just due to people dropping it on the floor, you know, human error. Uh, but it's really, really tiny quantities. The national programme have set us a target of um, not wasting so much percent of the vaccine and uh, that Wakefield's nowhere near even getting close to, to that amount of wastage. We did have an issue last week with the snow. Um, as you can imagine, people uh, over the age of 80 trying to get to a vaccination centre in um, quite a significant amount of snowfall that Wakefield had did pose a problem. The Pfizer vaccine, when it's received, um, it comes, it has to be stored in deep freeze. It's then thawed, it's delivered to the vaccination sites, and the vaccination site then has a three and a half day window to use 975 vaccine, well, no, a thousand, over a thousand and fifty vaccines. So uh, as you can imagine, it's quite um quite um a significant challenge if people aren't turning up for their vaccination appointments and and that might be due to a very genuine reason such as snow and it being unsafe for people to come out so what this program is about is getting as many vaccinations into people's arms as possible uh, with a first dose of the vaccine 
So to prevent waste, there may have been um, some people called in, but what we had, we had reserve lists of health and care workers. So for example, people that worked for Yorkshire Ambulance Service on the front line, um, community pharmacists, dentists, optometrists, the health visitors, where we had a reserve list where we could call on them very quickly to come in for a vaccine because they're more mobile and able to get through the snow to those vaccination centres. Anybody aged under 70 should uh, be in that priority cohort. We're not aware in Wakefield of anybody receiving the vaccine that uh, doesn't fit in any of the priority cohorts, even to prevent wastage. I don't know, Colin, if you want to back up that up with your experience on the front line. It's a, it, it, I'll be honest, it's, it's a bit of a scramble uh, when you're at the, the, the last hours of the last day for the vaccine. And there's lots of desperate phoning around because the staff are very clear they do not want to see any of those wasted and, 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 and binned. Um, and so there may be times when we've called upon some clinically extremely vulnerable people that will be under the age of 70, uh, 70 to come in at, at, at some of the sites. Uh, but but the, the aim is to stay within cohorts at this stage. <coughs> And, and yes, and so the clinically extremely vulnerable are part of uh, cohorts three and four alongside the over 70s. So it's entirely appropriate now that we are calling uh, those in, but we might have called them in earlier um, just to prevent that wastage. But it's entirely appropriate that they do get the vaccine and uh, they, they are part of that next priority group anyway so and it's very difficult you know to I mean we have the access but obviously people out there in the general population might see a 21 year old getting the vaccine but you don't know their medical history you also don't know often where they work or the work that they do so um, so it can be quite quite difficult to to know the reason why somebody a, a young person might have obtained that vaccine but it might be entirely genuine and like I say as a program we are not aware of um, any, and we do track the po population um, ages as well that have got the vaccine and there's very few younger people receiving the vaccine and, and they are health and care workers. Thanks Jo. Um, before we move on to the next slide I'm going to take some of the questions in the chat bar and there's a few questions that have asked um, that I'm going to uh, suggest Joe answers in regard to organisation at some of our um, PCN sites. So thing, questions about people having chairs to wait on, um, parking, which always comes up, um, and general organisation. So I just wondered, Joe, um, there's, there's some comments as well about whether there's going to be a site in Pontefract. So I just wondered if you could talk generally about how the organisation is working and again, and also how you expect Navigation Walk to be working next week. Uh, okay, so Navigation Walk I'll cover first from next week. They've gone through significant dry runs. Um, they've gone through really stringent tests with NHS England. Um, they are also working really closely with Wakefield Council, the highways and uh, parking uh, departments of Wakefield Council to ensure that, um, that there will be adequate parking and that there will be a flow. What I would say is, uh, please, to people, I know it's, it's difficult, but please try not to turn up to the appointment too early because um, the amount of vaccinations that are being offered each day um, is significant. I'll come next to St Swithens, which I know is mentioned in there. And uh, Colin, uh, I know you're going out there uh, today to visit with our head of primary care to have a look at St Swithens something that's just um, appeared on our radar today um, with in terms of people accessing the site and uh, through traffic etc and the the site of St Swithens um, the primary care networks chose that because um, with it being in the middle of a, a housing estate was that it could potentially offer um, vaccinations to people that may not have transport or live on that housing estate that might not be able to to get access to other parts of Wakefield so so that was one of the reasons why St Swithens was chosen to support that local community there um, but obviously it does appear that there's today um, what has happened is that uh, St Swithens because they've come on last they they only went live at the end of last week what has happened is that as um, vaccinators get more used to vaccinating they're able to vaccinate vaccinate more people per hour and the number of people that they are able to vaccinate a day has increased to, from today 
and uh, this is obviously um, causing an issue and it's something that we're going to go out and have a look at and um, come up with a solution as to uh, preventing this occurring again. So uh, Colin, I don't know if you wanted to come in on that one in particular. I know it's difficult before you go and do the site visit at four today. It is challenging due to the, 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 the numbers that we're trying to get through and, and people are often very keen. So uh, I don't, don't want to be late for their appointments to turn up early. And there's lots of factors that contribute together. The, the, the issue for the site is trying to maintain throughput, trying to maintain flow to, to minimize the, the, the you know, the amount of time that people are waiting and try to keep to, to appointment times. Uh, backlogs can occur due to, due to simple things happening, um, such as um, people, someone becoming unwell. So that happened, uh, happened to me yesterday in Castleford. Uh, so if someone has a, has a faint or, or, or we have a, a, a problem with vaccine uh, being made up and being supplied. Um, but, but certainly, you know, we're very, it's very important that the, the patient experience is, is, is a positive one and, and that people aren't left waiting, particularly in inclement weather. So we're going out to, to, to have a look and see uh, how we can improve the experience for, for people at St. Swithins. St. Swithins is a challenging site because it is embedded in a community, inside the community. And, and so parking is an issue, it is one of the rationale that we use when looking at sites. And it's probably the site that probably has the, is, is most challenged in terms of, of parking. Uh, and that's been a, a very difficult thing to balance uh, access uh, to a site by, by various means. Um, and then parking became difficult when it snowed, of course, and, and the risk of slip strips and falls. And then just on the point, sorry. All right, Joe, do you want to finish? Yeah, just on the point of, uh, I was just answering more questions, the, the point about the, the waiting area with the socially distanced chairs. Um, I'm under the impression that, it, again, it depends on the site, but many do have um, a waiting area with socially distanced chairs in them um, to, to manage um, an appropriate throughput. But again, if people do turn up too early, this, is, this may cause an issue, mind it, Colin? It can do, yeah, yeah, yeah. fortunately. Uh, but we have got um, chairs and waiting areas, but, but what we don't want is, is a lot of people collecting and waiting. Um, so, so it is important to try and not turn up too early for that vaccination appointment. Uh, what I will say is that, that in the main, um, the, the patient experience is very, very good. I, I don't want to, to sort of uh, just focus on on the negatives because we have had so, so many positives. In terms of Pontefract, um, that is one of the sites that we are looking at uh, with the community pharmacy to see whether we can provide a site there. So uh, more details to follow on that one once uh, site readiness and et cetera has uh, been uh, gone through with NHS England and improvement. Thanks, Jo. Um, do people need to find their own NHS number or will it be on the letter or can they just turn up and share, share their name and date of birth? So, I'll take so Oh, okay, go on. <laughs> uh, so, so you, you don't need your NHS number, you, but you do require it to book through the National Booking Service. But when you get your invite letter, the invite letter has your NHS number on it. When it comes to, uh, so that would that would cover the community vaccination sites uh, for the pharmacy and, and navigation walk. When it comes to uh, to PCN sites, your NHS number isn't isn't required because they will they will already know your NHS number, and there are ways to get around it if you don't know it. So it isn't you know most people don't really know their NHS number. It's it's hidden somewhere away, and we're not expecting them to have it on them. Thanks, Colin. OK, can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, OK, so I've got a question here around what plans are in place to inform and educate people in black and minority ethnic communities and other non-English speaking groups, where there might be concerns, where there might be questions, um, links to current good practice. And I'm going to, I, I'm happy for um, both Colin and Joe and Anna to, to jump in here, but from my personal perspective, um, I'm working on a work stream around people who might have um, access barriers of all sorts that might be practical barriers but it might also be um, information barriers um, there's a link gone into the chat around um, uh, different languages and vaccine information there's some really good websites that have information in different languages and different formats and it links really well to Valerie's post 
around um, a video call from a deaf person that she's just had who struggled to book because they received an invitation by letter. So um, I'm really happy to take that up outside of this session. We do have some resources to come and do online meetings like this with particular groups. So if we if you know that there's a particular group, we can do some question and answer sessions, present something like this um, in a slightly different format. Really happy to work with you to make sure that we know what works best for the people that you're um, working with. We've already started on some um, specialist ed, um, in engagement sessions to allow people to ask questions. And that's already generated some really good responses from community leaders who are keen to work with us and share the messages with their own communities. We're very clear that although we need to keep the um, NHS messages about the vaccination programme, that the conversations that people have in communities with their trusted message givers are absolutely key to getting those inf that information out. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a, a, a kind of an overview of what we're doing there. Um, and um, Valerie, I will be emailing you outside of this message, outside of this meeting to try and pick that up, because I think we could really produce some good solutions there and um, not duplicating at all what the CCG are already working on. Um, we had a question submitted around councils giving support to supermarkets regarding compliance to face coverings. Um, so I just wanted to cover that um, in regards to so the council via its um, team working at particularly staffed by environmental health officers can support in workplaces. But when it comes to compliance with legal re um, requirements, that goes down to the police. So if there are any, um, so you can, um, you can absolutely report to the council, but you might also need to report to the police. And the police are working closely with supermarkets and other places in order to help encourage compliance. The police would much rather encourage than enforce um, but they so just to let people know that there are those routes there. Could we have the next slide, please? OK, um, a question came in in advance to ask around differentiation between cohorts. So if I'm almost 70, am I likely to re receive my letter more than somebody who's just turned 65? And um, that's a really general question around the invitation process that I'm hoping Joe or Colin will be able to um, answer there. Um, and there's another question around um, individual choice about where to book, which I think you've already touched on, Joe. Would you like me to take that, Joe? Um, so yeah. it's it's most likely that, uh, well, our invitations so far have been based on age. So we took a decision very early on that we'd start out with our 104 year olds and work backwards uh, within each cohort group. Um, it's either tended to be alphabetical uh, in, in truth or but more likely age based. Um, however, it, each practice is getting through its cohort in, in terms of invitation generally within about um, seven to 10 days. Um, so that the delay hopefully isn't too great. Uh, and I hope that's not what people are experiencing. In terms of choice, when you get uh, an offer from the National Service, uh, you'll be offered anywhere that's within 45 minute drive of where you live. Um, so yes, that would include your needs, uh, Wakefield site and, and, and sites, sites going south. They don't link though to the to the GP uh, uh, GP offer, which is the local sites that we've previously been discussing as well. Yeah, and and just going on the the point about somebody having to go to York, um, that is because um, there are only limited amounts of sites available at the moment and slots available because. Um, they're not up to full capacity, as I've explained, um, it, you know, what the vaccination centres do very quickly, though, they get up to full capacity, but to, they start a little bit slower because they're, they're all new vaccinated staff, even though they've all vaccinated before and are competent. It's a new environment that we're, they're working in and they've done dry runs, but it never prepares you for the actual, you know, when your, your general public actually turn up. So... Um, so for the first few days, they will have reduced numbers of slots, but they'll open wider. And like I say, in Wakefield, from next week, we will have the uh, navigation walk and also the uh, the Morrison Morrisons from Thursday this week, and hopefully that other community pharmacy site at Pontefract uh, early in February. So um, with those slots opening up and more vaccine supply coming along to those places, we should find that people are able to, to access a, a vaccination closer to home than York. Um, in terms of the letters from the national booking system, um, from what I understand at the moment, I don't know in terms of priority group five because they've not informed us, but 
The letters for the 75 to 79 year olds have gone out this week and they will be sent to all 75 and 79 year olds um, in the Wakefield district um, because they live within a, a 40 minute drive of, of several of the centres now that will be opening um, over the next few weeks, um, including there's Ellen Road <coughs> and also John Smith Stadium at Huddersfield as well. So uh, for the people that live the Huddersfield side of Wakefield. So there, there is opportunity. You don't have to, like I said before, you don't have to go to a Wakefield site when you receive that letter. You, you should have a choice of places if you're able to get further afield if you want to do that. Are you on mute, Kerry? Sorry. <laughs> Can we just go back a couple of slides? Because there's a few more um, slides. There's a few more questions in the chat bar. So we'll just finish, finish up on questions before we move on. Um, Kerry, I'm just thinking there's a question about the Pfizer vaccine after 10 days. There is a question about the Pfizer got, vaccine after me. 10 days. Yep. I can't, so basically, no vaccine should be evaluated from day zero because the vaccine doesn't actually work until day 10 or day 14. So the Pfizer vaccine has chosen to use a very, very unusual method of evaluation, which wouldn't be used by any other vaccine, um, which is they start um, doing the ev evaluation from day zero, not day 10 or day 14. So the fact it gives a 33% protection up to 10 days is actually really good, because um, you wouldn't expect to see much at all until about 10 to 14 days. So the 90% protection is after the, the, the requisite amount of time, so 10 days to, to 14 days, and that's why um, the data is, is skewed in, in, that, in that case. I think I've got that right, Colin. That's what we were told by the Chief Medical Officer anyway. No, no that's, ex that's exactly right. So it's, it's about 90% at two weeks uh, for, for Pfizer. The, the previous studies and and um yeah and it, it does i can understand how everybody's confused because you know the, the medical profession in some, in some ways gets confused until they've had time to digest the data uh but it, it, it looks like exactly right they've just they've measured too early for us to expect to see a significant effect yet uh, i just got Thanks, one question there. it was just about dna so none of these vaccines alter your dna um so that the, the uh, there is a vaccine that contains mrna but that isn't isn't part of the essential building blocks of our cell. That's what you you basically try to make a protein from the DNA. You translate it into into the messenger RNA, and it's the messenger short bit of the messenger RNA that we that we that we get put in, which gives an instruction on how to make um, uh, create a, a fragment of the virus so that the body can recognise that fragment. But we there's nothing in it that that alters the DNA of your body. Thanks. And there was a question further up the thread that I missed, Colin, about um, people's concerns about whether one or both of the vaccines affects fertility. So um, there was an initial question as to whether there was, there was some effect on fertility. And it was, it was largely because uh, they hadn't done the exact uh, trial. However, none of the vaccines are, all, are actually all that new and we have sufficient evidence that, that shows that they have no impact upon fertility. So. Um, Initially, we were saying if you were going to get, if you were planning on getting pregnant, to uh, to wait for two months after you'd had your Pfizer vaccine. Uh, but that uh, that piece of advice has, has now stopped because the, with, with the experience and further look at data uh, and further data that's been published that's coming out, there are, there are thought to be no concerns about effect on ability to conceive or effect upon um, uh, on a developing developing baby. And the other thing to be aware of is that w although we we say we don't vaccinate pregnant women in fact we can vaccinate pregnant women if we have a one-to-one -one conversation with that woman and they're able to make an informed choice uh, about what the evidence is out there and there are there are you know over 500 pregnant women in the country that have been vaccinated so far thank you so um we've got i know a couple of questions around transport um, and what I can say is, is, is there's a conversation happening this afternoon around transport and what investment and support we can help people with. Um, the feedback at the moment is that there haven't, don't appear to have been very many barriers in terms of transport being reported as yet, but we're aware that that might change as different cohorts are um, invited for vaccinations and of course as the models change. So there's a conversation happening this afternoon about that um, and the 
two people who've asked questions about transport might well want to join that. Um, and if not, then there's a kind of ongoing conversation about that. And I know it's a, it's a real concern that that shouldn't be a barrier for people to uptake their vaccinations. And we are hoping to provide some practical support as well. We just want to make sure that we design it to the best um, to, to best effect. Um, some really warming comments about um, how grateful people are and good feedback about the vaccination program um, in the chat bar. So I think that's really important to share with our with our staff and our very hard working teams, both on the front line and I suppose what we considered back office functions, but are, are no less intense in lots of ways. Um, so uh, there's a, a, an offer of a vaccination site um, in the southeast of Wakefield. Um, so I'll make a note of that and we'll we'll um, we'll kind of have a conversation about that outside, Tracy. Um, and we've been asked um, the difference between the two vaccines. Will you be offered the same one? Is it safe to have two different ones? Um, and I think my understanding is that if you offered your second dose, it should be the, the same as the first dose. And that obviously would be recorded on your medical records. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, 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 the intention is to offer a second dose of the same type. There are studies actually going on to look at whether you'd get better protection if you were given two different vaccine types. Uh, but that data isn't, isn't available yet. And probably that's probably going to happen quite quickly because, as we've all experienced, the, the, there's a lot of money available and a lot of people willing to volunteer to enable these studies to be done, which is why we've been able to produce vaccines so quickly. Uh, so I'd expect that we'd be starting to see some interesting information about that as we go further into the summer. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just move on to the last few slides now, just to let people know that they are there for reference. Could we move on? So just to remind people that we do have a national, national and a local testing service. So for people who um, find it difficult for whatever reason to access the national testing service, you can access our local testing service. Um, and that includes um, tests brought to your door. Um, and then somebody will wait and take away the completed test um, and, and submit that for you. Um, we also have our walk-in centre at the waterfront, which is for pre-appointments only. And I'm not proposing that we discuss lateral flow testing in schools and workplaces, but that is work carrying on a pace. So please come back to future sessions if you're interested in hearing more about that. Next slide, please. 